Psalms 12. Lord, we pray for your blessings upon the word now and, and it, the work of grace in our lives through the word that you've given us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, as a chief to the chief musician on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. I love that he gives, the, the you know, it's an eight-string harp and, and for the musicians that play to figure out, you know, you could actually put a melody to this somehow and that's the instrument you'd use. Uh, help, Lord, for the godly, the godly man ceases. For the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, everyone with their, his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. So the, it's, it's like what's happened to the godly man. And um, he's the faithful disappeared. Uh, among the sons of men, they're, they're either not standing up or they're just not present or they're not there at all. Uh, they speak, but then when he says with those that do speak, they speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, and flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Um, flattery is uh, a simple definition, is um, um, a compliment with an evil intent. You know, it's one thing to say, hey, that looks good on you, or wow, you built that? That really, I'm impressed. You fixed that? I don't know how you did that, but man, high five, because I, I, yeah, that's good. That's good work, you know? Or just something as simple, oh, you look nice today, or that looks good on you, or whatever. Just, it, it's, it's, it's gracious, it's just a normal compliment. But when, when the statement is flattery to work ruin, and the ruin it means that you're taking control over that person. The ruin is that you're using the compliment to get something from the person. And that can be something as simple as a sales tool to get something from somebody and to get their mind on another thing while you're flattering them about this, and then you say, oh, by the way, sign here, there's five copies, you know. Uh, or it's flattery to bring about some kind of event that would cause the person to be unfaithful to their husband or to their wife or to their moral structure in the Lord uh, or otherwise uh, when it comes to... Uh, uh, morality in any in any action, whether it's drinking or sexual or drugs or whatever, that they're being flattered about something so that they would then do something that's that's wicked, and that's 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 where it's beyond just a compliment. And that's what flattery is is uh, it has an evil nature to it by the sense of of what's meant here. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, and our lips and our own, who is Lord over us? What a heavy statement. He says, where's the godly? Where, where, where the godly man has ceased? And he says, for those that are, they flatter with their lips, they bring about all this stuff, and then they basically say, look, it doesn't matter what, they, what we say, because who is Lord over us anyway? Who's Who's going to tell us what to say? And it doesn't matter if it's CNN or Fox News. They can get to the place where they say, we can just say whatever we want. Because no, who's, who's Lord over us? We've, we've got the final say-so. And um, it's a, a, a sad condition when that's the national problem that's happening here. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. And I think prophetically, it's, he's speaking of the resurrection, that uh, because he'll set the captive free and he's come to, to bring uh, liberty to those that are in bondage and, and to give the gospel to the poor in Isaiah 61. So uh, for the oppression of the poor and the sighing of the needs, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns to bring the poor into a place where they're not, no longer oppressed. In other words, it's a, it's, a, it's a safe place for them. The words of the Lord are pure words. The silver tried in a furnace of earth, 
purified seven times. Your, uh, you shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side. When vileness is exalted among the sons of men. So the wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted. In other words, they can get away with anything when vileness is exalted. I think the best example of that is given to us in Matthew. In Matthew 26, when vileness is exalted. Um, You noticed, I'm sure you have, but when, when you look at the news, I mean, every once in a while, they'll, they'll show some cute little kitten in a tree or something, you know, and it's like, oh, you know, and they get them out of that, that or out of a drainage ditch or, you know, some horse that fell in a, in a pit and they were able to get them out or something. But the bulk of the news is pretty vile, isn't it? In fact, there are times when... I, because I'll go to different news channels, and, and I like PBS because you get more of a world news and one American news and some of the others. But PBS seems to have just a little bit broader picture, and they'll show you more things that are going on. Uh, some of the financial news will, will take you different places. But when you watch those shows and you see the news of what's happening around the world and different things, and you're thinking, wow, or you read about it, and you're thinking, all this, what's going to happen? They need to deal with it. And then you see the 6 o'clock news or the 11 o'clock news. And it's none of those things that are really critical, financial, political, uh, not back talk and everything else, but some real key issues of what's happening in Europe, what's happening in Africa, uh, what's happening in, in, the, uh, in the Middle East, uh, just all over the world, and what we get for our general news is pretty vile, isn't it? I mean, it's just, it's, whether it's a car chase or a shooting or a rape or, uh, you know, a kidnapping or whatever, and yeah, it happens, but when you look at the news of the world, to spend that much time and then three times that time on baseball or football or whatever else, the sport just to, you know, placate us for a while, but the news, the hard news, is usually the vile side of it, if you will. This is what I'm getting at. And I, and, but there are times when the vile nature ends up very destructive. It's just not just here and there, but it becomes the norm. And this is what happened uh, when we see the prophecy fulfilled in, in Matthew 26. And what we're gonna, I'm just going to take bits and pieces of this, and you're probably familiar with it, uh, but to... To, to fill in the blanks you can do later, the parts that I'm skipping over because it's a story part of the issue that I'm dealing with. In verse 14 of chapter 26, uh, then one, uh, yeah, then one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver and so from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Here's one of only 12 people on the planet that Jesus Christ had around him for three years that were, he, in fact, Judas was trusted with the money, that were entrusted with his safekeeping, his ministry, his resources, and even, and which he did when they went out two by two and they laid hands on the sick and they prayed for the sick and, and, and they were the ones passing out the food and representing Christ. There was only 12 of them. And this guy sold the Lord out for 30 pieces of silver. And if you've ever had somebody betray you, stab you in the back in any way, uh, take from you for whatever reason, but usually it has something to do with money, you get just a little bit of a taste of this. And isn't it the same thing going on today in the world? When they really get down, well, why did that happen? Well, there are 150 million here and 4 billion there, or this company, you know, whatever that's going on, it has something to do with somebody trading off the money, isn't it? In um, verse 40, 
They came to the disciples and they found them sleeping. Or he came to the disciples, found them sleeping. So here he is praying, God, let this, pa- this cup pass from me. And uh, said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour, watch and pray, lest you enter to, into temptation? He said, you know, this, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Well, of course, they didn't wake up. They slept. And um, so here he's got one of the 12 that betrays him, sells him for 30 pieces of silver, and he's awake. He's negotiating. He's doing this, and he's going to come and, and the, the, kiss him in the final betrayal. And I mean, he's wide awake, boy. Evil can wake you up, can't it? I mean, all you, all you got to do is think, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the word and pray. Oh, what's that? Oh, my goodness, you know, right? The, um, the other disciples slept. So everybody around him, everybody around him, uh, in some way, and Peter even more so, uh, betraying him, beginning with Judas. And then in verse 47, while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve with a great multitude with swords and clubs, uh, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. Why did they come after him with swords and clubs? They never, you know, uh, Peter had a sword and, you know, he, he told me, he says, you know, you got one sword, you got enough, that kind of thing. You don't need a whole bunch. And, and yeah, that was just for traveling in the road. But they weren't out robbing people or causing riots or doing anything like that. So why were they doing it? Because if if their nature is violent, they're going to assume the response is going to be violent. If someone has a paranoid uh, mentality, they're going to assume that the things that they're thinking that they would do, yeah, that's probably not, they'll do it. Well, so they're probably going to do that to me. And it just makes the paranoia even worse. And so his betrayer had given them a sign saying, whomever I kiss, he is the one to seize him. So seize him. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? They came and they laid hands on Jesus and they took him. So not only does he betray him, not only is he awake, but now he pretends, he feigns friendship, even the, the common embrace and kiss of a close friend in their culture. And here he's selling him to be crucified. Vile times. And then in, in verse 63, Jesus kept silent when he was asked all these questions and about the people that were testifying against him and And um, the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So here the one that's supposed to represent God to the people. Like, you know, this would be like a, uh, not just a pastor, but a pastor among many pastors. Billy Graham's an example and others that that would, you know, people look to and say, you know, what, what do you think of all this? And he's challenging the Messiah. But you know, there are churches now that are challenging the scriptures and challenging the Messiah. You know, did he really say this? Is he really the only one? Uh, Was God telling you everything in the scriptures or did he leave some things out or were these things really of God? It's called the emergent church, and it's, it's just becoming so user-friendly, and they don't talk about sin. They don't talk about the blood atonement. They don't talk about the, and they don't like prophecy at all. They, but everybody feels good, and everybody comes, and they leave feeling good and everything and all of that. It's just a, a Laodicean kind of thing. And um, it's, it's such a, a, a fraud that's being brought, but it's being brought by religious leaders, and so this religious leader says, uh, is, uh, asks him the question to, to answer based upon the, 
uh, swearing by God. And he says, it is as you said. In other words, he's the Christ. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Well, that did it for the high priest. He tore his clothes saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witness? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. And really, he was the one that was the blasphemer and uh, hadn't checked the scriptures out, hadn't seen what was happening was a fulfillment like Nicodemus was more aware of what was going on, but not, not so with the high priest. What do you think? They answered and said, well, he is deserving of death. Then they spat in his face, beat him. I mean, you've seen enough movies and different things, or maybe you've seen it personally. But somebody that can't defend himself, he's bound. When they hit him, he'd fall. They'd kick him and beat him and everything. And the, the reason for him taking it really was he was becoming sin for us. And that means the very nature of what happens to people, what happens to them, and what happens by them. He's involved in all of it now. They spit on him in his face. They beat him. Others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? Boy, can you imagine having that on your mind the rest of hell if they didn't repent later? Verse 72, and again he denied with an oath. This is Peter now speaking as, as he's being challenged. You're from Galilee, aren't you one of those guys? But again he denied an oath and he said, I don't know the man. Really? Really? And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse, to swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word of Jesus and said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. The thing about Peter is... Here, he's now in the same league, but not the same uh, spirit as Judas. That he betrayed the Lord, not for money, but for fear. And God later on restores him, uh, which gives hope. If, if you've been in that situation, and you've done some things, and you've said some things, and, and you blame God for things and everything else, can you still be um, brought back into God's loving care and direction? Yeah, you're a child of God. He'll discipline you. He chastises you. But one thing he always does is he puts his arms around you and he loves you and he's there for you and he'll encourage you and minister to you and forgive you. And we see that uh, with Peter. But in the meantime, he's caught up into the things of the world and the cares of the world and he's worried about dying and being beat and, and the things that are happening to Jesus and you, just common fear. When morning came, all the, all the chief priests, so you got the high priest, now the chief priests and the elders, uh, the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And um, that seriously is happening in the world today where there are religious leaders that are plotting to put the church to death, to do everything they can to close the doors. Uh, I think we have a little bit of a reprise, reprieve now uh, uh, with prayer in the White House, with gather, Christian gatherings and everything from Christmas, all the other things and some of the other laws being changed and, and hopefully the Supreme Court and everything else. But the attack is still on. They're relentless. The devil's not going to give up uh, to destroy uh, Christ as far as the church. Uh, when morning came, all the chief priests and elders, the people plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And then, um, in other words, here's the irony. They do something totally illegal, and then they try to make it in a public forum legal. So what they do, they, well, we'll get tested in the Supreme Court later on, but right now, you know, we'll make this public showing. Uh, but everything they've done behind the, the doors have been, have been wrong. Verse 17 um, we find now uh, Barabbas, which means son of the father, is offered up as a, as to, take, uh, to be set free, or Jesus. Which one do you want? You want the criminal or you want Christ? Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to, to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? Almost reminding them. You know, he's this guy, are you sure you want to do this? He's called the Messiah. 
In verse 20, the chief priests, not the people, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes, and uh, multitudes are persuadable, that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Not just one, but both things. The uh, governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate said to them, no. What then do you want me to want to do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they said to him, let him be crucified. In verse 26, they released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And, of course, the scourging of Jesus, the, the uh, some say 39, but I believe it would have been 40 stripes because they would have shown him no mercy. Um, and uh, beating him, tearing his back open with a, with a whip that would have in it anything from lead pieces to uh, rocks or different things. We don't know exactly what they'd put in there, but they did put specific things in the lead. So when they hit, it would rip the flesh open. And uh, if someone confessed, they were easier on them. But he had no sins to confess, so it would have been worse every, with every lashing. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, mocking him, in other words. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and took a reed, and they struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. You know, later on, we know that not only did they mock him that way, but then they, uh, when they uh, took the robe off him, they sold uh, his garments. And just the, the whole dignity of a person, I mean, not only beating him, but stripping him down and, and humiliating him. And uh, every aspect of, of dismantling a person's um, um, concept of themselves, or uh, humility in front of people or, or, or any of that. They've stripped them of all of that. And why would God allow it? Why, of all the chess moves that we talked about on Sunday, why would he allow that? Because as he came as a man, as a pawn, and the the church, it appeared, the believers, the, the bride was being killed, was being, had been destroyed essentially. But that pawn made it to the other side of the board to become the one that could control and take the kingdom. God's purpose and God's plan God's grace and sufficiency in the midst of all of this violence talks about in, in Psalms 12 of a vile time, and that's what we live in now. And it's going to get worse in many ways. There's constantly this preaching about anarchy and stuff from, that people want to overthrow the government and raise up a new constitution and all that. We won't fare well with that. I pray it doesn't happen, that we won't, we'll rapture it happen before that, but it's, it's an ongoing battle. It'll go on beyond the eight years of, uh, or the four years or whatever happens with the president now, uh, but it's a, it's a battle, an ongoing battle, so it hasn't stopped from that time to this, but why would, why would Christ take all of that? I, go back to um, uh, Psalms 12. And in uh, verse 6, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words. We know the prophecies in Isaiah 53 and Psalms 22 and so on about the crucifixion, about his death. Like silver tried in a furnace, purified seven times. And what he went through, I think, is a fulfillment of that. If the, if the least, this is an allusion to this uh, particular issue. And that is that there are seven things that Jesus said. At the crucifixion. And I believe it, it, what it was doing was purifying 
or showing that his words were pure. He said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. The first words out of the cro- at the cross, God, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know. I mean, look back at your life before Christ, or if you don't know Christ tonight, where you're at right now, and there's a veil, a snare of the fowler, a blindness to sin, excuses for everything. Uh, But when you get saved, it's like, wow, was I that person? And then the longer you're in the Lord, the more you reason what that, the more you understand what that person was. But at this point, he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. God, give us that grace that we could look at people that offend us because of Christ. People say, you know, God, forgive them. They don't know. It prevents us from being angry and retaliating. Then he said in Luke 23, 43, Verily I say unto you, truly, truly, in other words, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. And it's that relationship of whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he was calling on the name of the Lord. He was calling us, you know, just take me to paradise with you. And uh, the response was automatic. You know, you will be with me in paradise. You will. He seeks and he saves those that are lost. If you're lost tonight, I'm very serious about this. If you're lost, you don't know where you're going, what's going to happen. If you died tonight, if you walked out the door and some idiot drunk driver mows you down and then keeps on going, they never even find out who it is. If that happens, where will you go? Your soul's going to leave your body and they'll, you know, grieve your parents and your family or whatever afterwards. But where are you? I mean, it's like I take a, I wear a suit and I take the suit off and I hang it up. And I go, oh, that's a nice looking suit. Yeah. But I'm not in it. You're not going to be in your body. You're gone. Where will you be? If you're lost, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ so that you know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And then he said, <clears throat> woman, behold your son, behold your mother. John 19, 26 through 20 and 27. <clears throat> and then he, he, what he was doing was he made provision for her. He instructed John to take care of her. And just a, an instruction for all of us that you're, we're responsible for each other's responsibility and especially our own responsibility, whether it's having a person, a health care facility, a family member or whatever, to take care of especially the ones that have already been mothers, that have been widows, that are there and that need help to do something uh, in some capacity, especially for our family, but reaching beyond that as John was doing for his family and saying, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there for you. What we see there at the cross is what an example of not caring about yourself, but caring about others. I mean, really. You're up there, you're beaten. He, you couldn't even recognize him as a man. He's stripped, humiliated. And he says, John, get over here. My mother, I, w- I want you to make sure you take care of her. It's my mom. You watch out for her. Then in John 19, 28, he says, I thirst. I thirst. This is an example of his humanity. When he was on the cross, he didn't all of a sudden just, you know, strip himself of all of that and God Almighty, though he's always God, but he limited himself to be man. And so even to the point of being hungry, being sleepy, you know, all of those things we see him uh, as he uh, walked on the earth. Now in his death, he's, he's thirsty. And he goes, I thirst, I thirst. And just the humanity of it all. And then he said, it is finished, John 19, 30. It is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. It's finished. Taken all the sin, he's saying, upon myself, He has taken it, and by taking it, by becoming sin, he who knew no sin became sin. He took every sin you've ever committed, every sin you were born into, 
who you are, who I am, and what we've done, our sin nature as well as the breaking of the law, took every penalty of that and took it upon himself. That's why he was kicked, he was beaten, all of those things happening to him, and then ultimately the humiliation and the death upon his life. Every aspect of it to now say, debt has been paid. I have paid the debt for humanity. And then in John, Luke twenty three forty six, Father, into your hands I commit, I commend my spirit. Why do you do that? Well, the wages of sin is death, so now he paying the price would take and bring his blood to the very altar of God, sprinkle it on the mercy seat to set us free. So now he ever lives to make intercession for us. Because of that, because he died, when we go to God and we say, God, forgive me for my sins. Come into my life. Save my soul. He can't, it's not a matter of him saying, well, I, I just forgive you for all of your sins. Well, then God isn't just because he says the wages of sin is death. That's not right. I don't care what kind of a judge it is. That's not right. So wait a minute. Just because you know the guy, you say, okay, you get off. Who's, who's going to pay back the penalty? And the judge of the whole earth sent his son to pay the penalty. So Jesus stands before the judge and says, I paid the penalty. I paid the price. I died. And this one's accepted me. He's family now. He, she, they're free. God says, penalty paid, you're free. <laughs> Those seven things, purified seven times, I think is a great example of the absolute uh, pureness of the Lord, of his word, of fulfilling his word, of completing it, and then in the midst of fulfilling it, that he lived it out with such purity, without hypocrisy and holiness, that we see it in the worst possible state of life and the worst possible condition of life, being beaten, being humiliated, being mocked, being betrayed, being you know nailed, being stabbed, everything that happened and he would say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Purity. You don't get any more pure than that. To look out for the needs of others. Take care of my mom. That's the God that we serve. That's the Jesus of the Bible. That's the one that he said to Nicodemus, you want to really know what it means to enter the kingdom of God? You must be born again. You must be saved. If you don't know him, when you take communion tonight, receive him. Give your life to Jesus Christ. And his spirit, as the question was brought up earlier, his spirit will enter in. And he will never leave you or forsake you. He'll always be with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings, the outpouring of your spirit upon our lives. We thank you for the price that you paid that is beyond our imagination. When sin happens to us, when we are betrayed or lied to or deceived or something is taken from us or we get physically hurt or any number of things happen, how we feel about it, especially if it's somebody really close to us. Lord, whether it's a, a mate or a business partner or whatever it is, our first response is we want judgment. And yet all of that happened to you, not because you're a sinner, as we are, but you took that for us. You became that for us. And then turned back to us, the ones who have betrayed you, have sold you out, have denied you, have run from you, have stabbed you in the back, have lived prior to Christ an idolatrous life or even in Christ sometimes, hurting you. And yet you say, Father, forgive each one of us and not lay the sin to our charge because you, because you and you alone paid the price. We can't thank you enough, Lord. But tonight we want to remember what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.